Good morning, everyone. You know, I came from uh, South Canada, from a small county called the United States, uh, <laughs> and a small, tiny city called Boston. Uh, I don't have Bostonian accent, despite being in Boston for almost 20 years. Uh, uh, let me uh, first uh, say my disclosure here. Uh, take your time to read it. Uh, but to mitigate uh, this uh, disclosure, I would like just to present only the data that uh, published and be reviewed and presented in big conferences. So before I start, I would like to uh, thank three people, uh, John, Cyril, and David, for inviting me here. Uh, I had been in diabetes field for almost 34 years. And all my work had been on weight management and nutrition and lifestyle for people with diabetes. And to sum all my experience for all those years, I will do it in one single slide. And this slide is here. Uh, <laughs> you know, the problem in, in diabetes, as you all know, is because of the increase in body weight. Uh, uh, if you had been in the US, in Phoenix, Arizona, and some other places, there is a restaurant called Heart Attack Grill. Uh, they serve a lot of nice burger, one called single bypass burger, second, double bypass burger, triple bypass, quadruple bypass burger, which is like 7,000 calories with butter shaken, and, and so on. So you can imagine where we are and how we are moving and how things are and so on. And we have been uh, trying for years and years and years to see how we can solve this problem. Uh, finally, we have very, very good solution uh, that uh, is no longer embargoed. It was presented two days ago in the American Diabetes Association, if you came in the first day. Uh, and uh, the data is from uh, our Y weight program at Josden. This is in real world clinical practice. So this is not in uh, very strict clinical trials. And you can see here, for, th for the first time, we're able to show that people for five years and real world clinical practice can maintain 6.4% weight loss. Not only that, more than 50%, 53% maintained 9% uh, weight loss. Uh, we were honored this year that uh, this study got the Michaela Moden Award at the best study uh, for the year in prevention and management of diabetes. But the most interesting, in the same conference, we presented data to compare why weight program uh, for the first time to bariatric surgery. And interestingly, you can see with left band, uh, there's some additional weight loss, but if you look to the A1C, uh, after one year, it is exactly the same. Not only that, all the primary end points, second end points, which is resolution of diabetes or remission from diabetes, to be accurate, uh, is exactly the same. And the white weight, we were able to cut medication by 50 to 60%. We were able to have remission around 14% of people with diabetes. And we got the biggest uh, fund from NIH now to develop this model for primary care physician uh, across uh, the entire United States. But the most interesting, if you look here and uh, you look to the physical and mental uh, components of the quality of life, and you can see with the Y weight programs, there is improvement at 10% weight loss after one year market improvement. And you can see very little improvement, no improvement with uh, bariatric surgery and by the end, slight improvement. On mental health, this is big difference. You can see with the Y weight market improvement in mental and you can see this the same at one year. You don't see any improvement in mental health with bariatric surgery. And there is many data to show even uh, co uh, uh, cost of comparison between both. So this is an example of a patient enrolled in the Y weight program, uh, has diabetes for 17 years, uh, managed on two oral medication, uh, more than 100 units of insulin, A1C 7.3, and then you can see this patients after 
Uh, she lost uh, weight and maintained that weight loss for five years. And the A1C now is in 6%, zero medication, and diabetes remission for six years. Uh, so uh, let me lead some discussion around what we did. And I will get to the component as well of the meal replacement. This is a multidisciplinary program. So it is not dietary only or exercise only or education only or behavior modification only, but we add big component of change in even diabetes medication. So the major difference between look ahead study, which I believe all of you had been uh, aware with this study. I was one of the co-investigators in the look ahead and diabetes prevention program in the US. What we did is that we fixed the caloric intake down for women around 1,500, men around 1,800. All of them, uh, like the look ahead, we give them two liquid meal replacement, uh, this diabetes specific meal replacement, two snacks and transition to regular diet in week 10. But the most interesting is that the exercise component is 300 minutes per week in comparison to 175 minutes in the look ahead and here more strength exercise in comparison to just aerobic exercise. Uh, dietary pattern is entirely different between both. In the look ahead study, carbohydrates were 55%, protein was around 15%. In the Y weight program, uh, carbohydrates was no more than 40 to 45%, and glycemic index was low, and uh, protein was a little bit higher. Uh, went up to 1.5 to 2 grams per kilograms of the body weight. So let me remind you with very old theory. I'm not sure uh, how valid this now, but this is how Elliot B. Joslin used to treat diabetes in 1923. And the diet Elliot Joslin was giving to his patients, it is very interesting, very eccentric diet. Just 10 grams of carbohydrates, only 2%. And 75% of the diet was from fat, and actually 1,800 calorie diet. And in his diet, he was able to cure every single case of type 2 diabetes. Uh, it, co it was called fatty diabetes during that time. And he was on also able to keep people with type 1 diabetes alive for 10 years. So how he was giving them uh, butter and bacon and fat and all those kind of stuff and was getting those people healthy. And from that time, he and Frederick Allen said that diabetes is a carbohydrate intolerance disease. Carbohydrate intolerance disease. That term had been lost in 1977. So who had been in diabetes field that long uh, know that that term had been changed. And this was the biggest problem that we ever had in the history of the diabetes management. So after discovery of insulin, uh, he was able to give his patients slightly more and more carbohydrates. So the way they treat diabetes in 1917, 1923 is called advanced carbohydrate diet. So day one, they give them zero carbohydrates, they test their urine for glucose. Day two, they give them 2%, they test their urine, Day three, they give them 5%, 6%, 10%. And when the glucose start to appear in their urine, they say, stop. This is your maximum. Eat whatever you like from the others, but it's your carbohydrate at that level. But with insulin, they were able to go up. But interestingly, it looks like we went way up. This is the problem. We went way up. Most of the trials showed that if you cut the carbs down to around 40%, and this is data from Frank Nuttall and Mary Gannon. And you can see clearly, once you reduce the carbohydrate to around 40%, you increase the protein to around 30% in comparison to 15%, the area under the care for glucose is down by 40%. Uh, triglycerides significantly down, more than even 40%. So we know now that carbohydrates in people with diabetes need to go down. Whether vegetarian, non-vegetarian, whatever it is, carbohydrates needs to go down. The most important is that uh, when they reduce a the carbohydrates, I can see from 60% to 40%, visceral fat went down, insulin level went down, and marked improvement in insulin sensitivity. So we lost this data in translation over time. So what happened in 1977, 
the U.S. Congress formulated uh, a nutrition committee, politician, and they decided to increase carbohydrate for the entire nation. You can Google and you can go to 1977. And this is a time uh, that happened, 1977. And you can see protein remained the same. And here is fat is down by 10%, carbohydrate by up by 10%. And you can see obesity went way, way, way up. So in reality, we shot ourselves in our feet. And we up till now are complaining. Oh, you people get diabetes, are obese. You know, they are because we keep telling them eat too much carbs. This is a problem. Uh, just for your information, fat can only make people gain weight as a lipogenic hormone in the presence of insulin. The stimulus for insulin secretion is carbs. This is what's called the bread and butter theory. So when you eat carbs, you stimulate insulin. Insulin take the fat and put the fat in the adipose tissue by its lipogenic activity. This is a scenario. If it is visceral fat, inflammation, TNF alpha, IL-6, BI1, MCP1, and many other problems. So uh, uh, in reality, Jocelyn Diabetes Center 2005 changed the entire dietary plan that we give to our patients. And our idea is to cut the carbs down to around 40% and cut the glycemic index down and increase the protein intake. And I will explain why we increase the protein intake. And then the fat, I have no problem with the fat. The major problem with the fat is a trans fat. Uh, we are not sure about any, anything else in the fat, uh, you know, to the limit that maybe we can argue about saturated fat. But the most in interesting also in carbs, as David mentioned many, many times, no one is listening that low glycemic index is important. Actually, if you lower the glycemic index, uh, you can see uh, A1C is down by 0.4%. Unfortunately, in the ADA this year, a uh, poorly controlled study showing that low glycemic index increased insulin resistance. But in reality, this in non-diabetic population, you cannot take this data and put it in people with diabetes. Low glycemic index reduce post brindial blood glucose level. That's why it works. Uh, so you cannot take the data from uh, no diabetes, uh, non diabetics, and apply it in diabetes. The most interesting also is every time you increase a protein, and here is you increase a protein to 30% from 15%, even in five weeks, A1C is down by 0.8%. It's very important for us to understand one unique issue in diabetes. People with diabetes lose muscle mass every single year. If their diabetes is not controlled, they lose around 450 grams of the muscle mass every single year. Now, if you give them low caloric diet, you fix the ratio around 15%, you are giving them very low absolute protein. They lose even more muscle mass. Around 25% of the weight loss is muscle mass. So to minimize that weight loss from muscle mass, and to have very successful weight loss, you need to give more protein and more strength exercise. And if people have hypogonadism, you give them testosterone as well. This is why why weight program worked, weight achievement and intensive treatment program worked, was we give them more protein, more strength exercise, and that's how the results was uh, effective. Again, you had seen this data many times, high protein, low glycemic index diet after 8% weight loss is the best diet to maintain the weight loss for longer duration. Uh, so uh, this dietary pattern is what we used in the Y weight program. But in reality, uh, if you give people any diet, whatever the diet is, people will regress to eat what they used to eat. Unless you give them a meal replacement that has that composition. So many companies now produce the meal replacement that have higher protein, low glycemic index, uh, uh, slowly digestive carbohydrates, more monounsaturated fat, and fortified with amino acids to help people with diabetes. So let me uh, show you the early data that we have from Look Ahead study. After one year from Look Ahead study, we look to weight loss in relation to those people using this meal replacement. And we found that people who are taking two per day over a year lost 11.2% in comparison to people who eat that meal replacement in lower frequency. 
It was very interesting and intriguing data, but we now over time, we started to realize that uh, those mean replacement, or I, I prefer to call them glycemic, glycemia targets, specialized nutrition, actually improve glucose control, improve body weight, reduce insulin to some extent, and help weight loss. But more and more data now is telling us they can stimulate insulin, they can increase GLP-1 uh, hormone, and I will share some of this data with you. So here is uh, data from Professor Tati in Italy. What he did, uh, he take group of people, 96 uh, patients, and advised them to uh, cut the caloric intake. If they lost more than 5% by 12 weeks, they continue. And if they lose less than 5%, they give them one glycemia target specialized nutrition, diabetes specific formula. And then I started to evaluate them, just one. So he replaced 200 calories with 200 calories. And interestingly, here is a group that lost more than 5%, continued to lose weight, but this is a group didn't lose 5%. Once they got one GTSN, as you can see, more weight loss. Interestingly, the same uh, happened with the A1C, and you can see the A1C start to drop uh, with a difference uh, which is significant, around 0.3%. So this is, again, uh, very interesting. Not only that, they found that the variability in the blood glucose level is much less. Here is before, after, before, after. Variability of the blood glucose level is much less because the low glycemic index effect. Then, what is the impact? This is a whole new idea about the GLP-1 hormone. GLP-1 hormone is a satiety hormone. It also stimulates uh, beta cells to secrete insulin, suppress glucagon production, improve diabetes. We have tons of medications now in the US, everywhere, DBB4 inhibitor, GLP-1 analogs. So what is the impact? You know that many of the amino acids in protein actually very potent stimuli for GLP-1 hormone. You can see several of them here. So once you eat any protein that has those amino acids, you don't need the glucose stimulation, which mostly lost by the beta cell, and the protein now is stimulating the beta cell to secrete insulin in a very efficient way. Uh, interestingly, mono, uh, monosaturated fatty acids and saturated fatty acids, saturated fatty acids, actually stimulate GLP-1 hormone more than carbohydrates. Uh, we blame the saturated fat for many, many years. Uh, I'm happy that Anthony presented very nice data about the dairy products uh, in our Lancet article, uh, uh, myself and Frank Hu and, and Mohan and Lee. Uh, we presented data that actually dairy products reduce significantly the risk for type two diabetes. But I would like just to add that my theory is also related to vitamin D. You know, vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. If you skim the milk, you don't absorb the vitamin D. Even if it is written on the bottle, fortify it with vitamin D. You need the fat. Not only that, saturated fat also is a potent component of nutrition that raise HDL. That's why when you look to some of the meta-analysis between saturated fat and coronal artery disease, you'll not see uh, uh, any big effect in at least five meta-analysis from 2008 up till now. So here is another study, and they give uh, oatmeal, and they give uh, 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 no breakfast, no breakfast is in blue, and they give uh, oatmeal, and you can see here, and then they give the meal replacement, diabetes-specific meal replacement, and you can see the blood glucose uh, level is low, and GLP-1 hormone, GLP-1 hormone significantly low. It's like four or five times higher just by uh, giving uh, that product. So this is a last uh, study. We presented this study in the ADA a few days ago. Again, testing two types of GTSN in comparison to oatmeal. Uh, Cross-sectional study uh, has 12 male, 10 uh, females, and we invited them for three different days. Each day, we give them 200 calorie oatmeal or one GTSN or another GTSN with different blend of amino acids to see what is the impact on glucose, insulin, GLP-1 hormone over four hours. And here is the results. 
Here is when you give oatmeal, you can see the blood glucose level up to four hours is high. If you give any one of those GTSN, the blood glucose level is significantly lower, significantly lower. But the most interesting, if you uh, uh, look to the area are, uh, under the curve uh, uh, from the baseline, you can see here is oatmeal, and then you can see the two uh, GTSN, one of them even can drop people to the lower glycemic uh, level. N interestingly, one of them which has more blend of amino acids, you can see the insulin stimulation is significantly up. This is, looks for me, uh, mind that those people have diabetes for 10 years. So we're assuming that they, are, they don't have capacity to in, produce insulin, but they are producing significant amount of insulin just in response to this amino acids, which means that this is important part in the diabetes diet. If you look to the GLP-1, again, here is the oatmeal, and you can see with the tumor replacement, GLP-1 is going up. So in reality, we know now that changing dietary composition in people with diabetes especially cutting the carbs down and increasing the protein up, which will induce satiety and will stimulate GLP-1 hormone and insulin, maybe have beneficial effect uh, in diabetes. So in conclusion, I would like just to mention that uh, those types of diabetes specific formula is now integral part of the medical nutrition therapy. We are using them now in the white weight program, and we use them in the look ahead study. We use them uh, to some extent in the diabetes prevention program, and they help people to lose a nice amount of weight. But the major issue is that if you move to natural food, you have to follow the, uh, the good dietary composition in that scenario. Uh, finally, we published uh, all our experience uh, in the white weight program. Uh, this is a Harvard Health publication. Uh, now translated many places, why wait in many countries now across the globe? I hope to see it uh, in Canada and uh, in, in many places in Europe uh, very soon. Before I end, I went to the heart attack girl to get the experience. Uh, they bought the gown, they bought the tag, they take check your heart and give you that sandwich. If you can eat it, they take you, take you with wheelchair to your car. They have ambulance by the door if you get heart attack. With this, thank you so much.